Welcome to our presentation on Stage 2 of Meaningful Use. Today we will cover the basics of Stage 2 Meaningful Use. We'll look at the additional requirements that will be set upon your practice, as well as compare Stage 1 measures versus Stage 2. By the end of the session today, you should walk away with a better understanding of what your practice will need to do to attain Stage 2 of Meaningful Use. We will not cover any training on how to complete each measure from within our software. We will conduct a separate session on product training sometime early in 2014. Our target audience today are the practices that have attested or will have attested by the end of 2013 to at least two years of Stage 1 Meaningful Use. If you will have completed two years of Meaningful Use by the end of 2013, then you are ready to move to Stage 2 in 2014. If 2013 is your first year completing Meaningful Use, then you can stay on this presentation. However, just remember that the requirements we will go over will not affect you until 2015. So let's start out by discussing some of the things that have not changed. Most of the additional requirements, beyond the actual measures, are still the same for Stage 2. Requirements such as the fact that you must complete two years of each stage before moving on to the next stage. Also, your very first year completing meaningful use is still a 90-day period. The actual attestation process is still conducted by going on to CMS's website and completing their online attestation tool. And of course, you still need to have an electronic medical record for 80% of your patients seen during the reporting period. Here is an updated payment schedule with what you can expect to collect based on the year that you started for both Medicare and Medicaid. Starting in 2013, for anyone participating in the Medicare program and completing attestation after April 1st, your incentive payments will be reduced by 2% due to the mandatory reductions in federal spending, or aka sequestration. The only example where your incentive payment will not be affected by sequestration this year is if it was your first year and you had tested for 90 days starting in January. For everyone else, your incentive payment will be reduced by 2%. Notice that the Medicaid program has not been affected by the sequestration since that program is exempt from the mandatory reductions. And let's not forget the goal of meaningful use, which still holds true. The goal of meaningful use, whether you feel this way or not, is not to disrupt your practice, but in fact to promote the spread of electronic health records so that in turn we will positively affect patient care. By encouraging the use of electronic records, practices should be able to share information more easily, allowing your providers to have more complete and accurate information on your patients. And in turn, that should promote the best possible care for your patient. On the patient side of the equation, they in turn will have access to their own records so they can be empowered to take a more active role in their health and the health of their families. Hopefully everyone, providers and patients, will see an improvement in our healthcare system within the next few years because of the Meaningful Use Program, if we stick to it and give it a chance. Okay, so enough about why you should be participating in the program. Now let's talk about the measures for Stage 2. In Stage 1, you are required to complete 15 core measures, 5 out of 10 menu measures, and 6 out of 44 clinical quality measures, or CQMs. In Stage 2, you will be required to complete 17 core measures, 3 out of 6 menu measures, and 9 out of 64 CQMs. So that gives you a total of 29 measures for Stage 2 versus 26 in Stage 1. So in the end, you are only completing 3 additional measures in Stage 2. Beyond 2014 being the first year that providers can attest to Stage 2, there is one other fact that makes 2014 a little bit different from previous years. And that is because all providers, regardless of their stage of meaningful use, only have to attest to a 90-day reporting period, like you did the first year that you attested. 
No one will attest to a full year of meaningful use in 2014. But it doesn't stop there. Depending on what participation year this is for you, and on which program you are enrolled for, the 90-day period will be different. For the Medicare program, if 2014 happens to be your first year for meaningful use, which by the way should not be the majority of people watching this presentation, but I'm going to cover it anyway. So if 2014 will be your first year, meaning that you are completing Stage 1, you can pick any 90-day period. However, in order to avoid payment adjustments scheduled to be applied in 2015 for non-meaningful users, you must attest by October 1, 2014. So really, for first-year participants, they can do any 90 days as long as it ends before October 1st. If 2014 will be your second or third year in the Medicare program, then your 90 days must be fixed to a quarter of the calendar year. You will not have the freedom to pick any time period. You must do it based on the quarters. And lastly, if you are participating in the Medicaid program, you can pick any 90 days. I'm going to assume that the majority of the people watching this presentation are in the Medicare program and will be beyond your first year in 2014. So just to reiterate this fact, since it's very important, you will need to pick your 90 days based on the quarter of the calendar year. Do not expect that you will be able to pick any time period to attest to next year. Okay, enough about those complicated rules. Let's move on to the actual measures. First, we'll discuss the core measures. Remember, you are required to complete all of the core measures and there are 17 total. As you can see by the colors, the majority of them are the same as Stage 1. The turquoise colored ones, numbered 1 through 9, are the same measures you completed for Stage 1. The purplish gray ones, numbered 10 through 17, are all new core measures for Stage 2. However, several of the new core measures are just some of the old menu measures that you may already be familiar with, like medication reconciliation, education materials, and patient reminders. Next, we'll go over each measure in detail outlining the requirements and what has changed for that measure, if anything. So first up is CPOE, Computerized Provider Order Entry. This measure has been expanded upon in Stage 2. In Stage 1, you had to have at least one medication documented electronically for at least 30% of your unique patients seen. This was a pretty easy measure since as long as you were doing your other required objectives, you pretty much had this completed without any additional work. In Stage 2, this measure won't be as simple as that. For Stage 2, this measure states that you must electronically document 60% of medications, 30% of laboratory tests, and 30% of radiology orders in the EMR. Again, I'm going to assume that you are already electronically entering your medications, so that part of the measure should not be a big deal. The part of the measure that you will need to be concerned with is the documentation of the lab and radiology orders. In order for our software to be able to count your orders, you will need to be clicking off your lab and radiology orders in your progress note through a procedure checklist. Some of you may already be doing this, so for those of you that fall into that category, that's great. You will most likely not have to change anything operationally to achieve this measure. However, many of you are not clicking off orders through our software, and or if you are, you may only be using a generic checklist. If you are currently using a generic checklist, you will need to convert to using a procedure checklist so that the software knows how to properly calculate the orders you are selecting. So your next question will probably be, how do I know whether my orders are in a generic checklist or a procedure checklist? There are three things that you can look for to determine this. First, if you have template editor privileges, you can go to the template and right click on the checklist. If the dialog that opens is labeled Procedure Checklist Properties, then you are good to go. You are currently using a procedure checklist for your orders. 
If the dialog is labeled Finding Checklist Properties, then you are using a generic checklist and you will have to convert it to a procedure checklist. If you do not have template editor privileges, then you can check on the type of checklist by going into the patient's chart and opening a progress note. When you click on a lab or radiology order, if you receive the Order Procedure dialog, the dialog where it allows you to select a diagnosis, then you are using a procedure checklist. If you click on a lab or radiology order and you do not receive the Order Procedure dialog, then you are using a generic checklist. So to recap, for Stage 2, the CPOE measure has been expanded to also include documenting lab and radiology orders along with medications. This measure is not encounter-based. The calculation includes all orders and is not based on the number of patients seen. In order for this measure to calculate properly, your labs and radiology orders will need to be set up in a procedure checklist. Core measure number two is your e-prescribing measure. In stage one, you are required to e-prescribe more than 40% of all permissible prescriptions through the EMR. In stage two, they have upped the percentage to 50%. Beyond that, there are no additional changes for this measure. Core measure number three is the demographics measure. In stage one, you are required to document race, language, ethnicity, gender, and date of birth on more than 50% of all unique patients seen. In Stage 2, they have upped the percentage to 80%. There are no additional changes to the requirements. However, be aware that in version 5.1, you will be able to configure more options for race and language, as well as multi-select race options to allow for more accurate documentation. Core measure number four is the vitals measure. In stage one, you are required to enter height, weight, and blood pressure on more than 50% of the unique patients age two and older. In stage two, again, they have upped the percentage to 80%, but they also changed the requirement slightly as well. Instead of all three vitals being required for any age, they have broken it down into three different reporting options to better align with what your practice deems relevant. You can select to report on any one of the following three options. Option one is all three vitals, which would include blood pressure for patients age three and older and height and weight for all ages. Option two is blood pressure only for all patients age three and older or option three is height and weight for all patients regardless of age. Our dashboard will display all three of these options as separate measures so that you may see your statistics for any scenario. Your provider should select the scenario that is most relevant to your scope of practice. Core measure number five is recording the smoking status. In stage one, you were required to document smoking status for more than 50% of patients age 13 and older. In stage two, they have upped the percentage to 80%. Beyond that, there are no additional changes for this measure. Core measure number six is decision support. In stage one, you were asked to set up one clinical decision support rule relevant to your specialty. In stage two, they have upped the requirement to five rules, and those five rules must be related to four or more clinical quality measures. The good news though, is many times we set up your decision support rule related to a CQM anyway, so the one rule that you do currently have might be ready for stage two without any changes necessary. There is a second part to this rule that is to have your interaction checking turned on. In stage one, this was a separate measure onto itself. And on top of that, it was one of those measures where you didn't necessarily have to do anything with it since our interaction checking is turned on by default. So in stage two, for whatever reason, they lumped the interaction checking requirement in with core measure six. So to recap, for clinical decision support in stage two, 
you will need to set up four additional rules and the rules you set up need to be related to the CQMs that you report on if possible. Core measure number seven is the ability to view online, download, and transmit patient health information. In stage one, you are required to provide this information within three business days to 50% of the patients that requested it. The keywords for that measure were for the patients that requested it. Since most patients were not aware of this functionality, many practices didn't need to do anything with this measure because none of their patients requested it. However, for stage two, that will not be the case. This is probably going to be one of the most impactful measures to your practice. For stage two, this measure becomes a two-part measure. The first part requires that 50% of all unique patients seen are provided online access to their health information within four business days. So the changes there are that they remove the wording for the patients that requested it, and they increase the business day requirement from three to four. Then they added a second requirement stating that more than 5% of unique patients seen need to view, download, or transmit their health information to a third party. This is where the Chartmaker Patient Portal comes into play. Your patients will use the patient portal to access their health information. Since patient information, such as demographics, labs, and clinical summary information, will automatically be sent to the patient portal upon note signing, as long as you sign 50% of your progress notes within four business days, you will have automatically achieved that part of the measure. Then the more difficult part will be to get 5% of your unique patients to log in and view their information. This will require some patient education on your part, explaining the importance of using the portal. So to recap, this measure is one of the measures that will require you to get set up with the Chartmaker Patient Portal since you will need to give your patients access to their health information with the ability to view, download, or transmit to a third party. Core measure number eight is the clinical summaries. In stage one, you are required to provide a clinical summary to 50% of your patients seen within three business days. In stage two, the percentage has stayed the same. However, they changed the time requirement to within one business day instead of three. That could be a little frightening to some people since before with the three business days, you had a little bit of a cushion. The good news though, is that upon note signing, the clinical summary will automatically be sent to the patient portal, giving you credit for providing it to the patient without the need for additional steps. So the key with this will be to either make sure you sign your progress note within one business day so that it is automatically uploaded to the patient portal, or just manually generate the clinical summary as you were doing, but making sure that it's completed on the day of their visit. Core measure number nine is protect electronic health information. This is the measure that requires you to have a manual detailing all that you do to protect patient health information, whether it is written, electronic, or verbal. This is a measure that comes up often during audits. Between stage one and stage two, this measure has not really changed. Some of the wording has changed, but in essence, it is the same. However, that does not mean that you do not need to do anything with it. You are required to keep this manual up to date so every year you should be assessing your procedures along with the manual to see if anything needs to be adjusted. Even if you feel that no modifications are necessary, you still need to be completing this process and then updating the copyright date to show that it has been revised. Remember, one of the key requirements to this measure is to perform a security risk analysis. STI can do this for your practice to cover network and hardware assessments However, this is only one subset of what is required for this measure. If you are interested in STI performing this analysis, please contact STI Managed Services.
Now we're going to talk about the core measures that are either completely new or were previously a menu measure. Core measure number 10 is incorporating lab results. In stage one, this was a menu measure requiring you to have the results of more than 40% of the labs ordered as structured data in the EMR. Since it was a menu measure in stage one, your practice may not have picked this measure. However, in stage two, all practices will be required to complete this measure. In stage two, this measure requires that more than 55% of lab orders results are incorporated into the EMR as structured data. In order for our software to calculate these statistics, you will need to do several things. First, you will need to document your lab orders through a procedure checklist. This will give us a count as to how many labs were ordered. Clicking off the lab in this manner will add an entry to the denominator. Then, once the lab result comes back, you will need to change the order status to completed or reviewed. Changing the order status will add an entry into the numerator, getting you credit for that lab being ordered. Since this process does not account for the requirement to incorporate lab results in the EMR, you have one last step to complete, which is documenting the lab result. There are two ways for you to accomplish this. You can either incorporate an electronic lab interface or, if that is not possible, then you can manually enter the lab result into a note and that would suffice. Obviously, incorporating the electronic lab interface is easier, so if that is available, we would suggest going that route. If you need information on setting up an interface with your lab vendors, please contact Software Support. So to recap for this measure, you will need to enter your lab orders through a procedure checklist Mark the lab as completed or reviewed when the result comes back and also have the lab results incorporated as structured data, whether that comes from an electronic interface or someone manually entering the data into your EMR is up to you. Core measure number 11 is generating a patient list. In stage one, this was a menu measure. However, most practices opted to complete this measure since it is so easy. In stage two, this measure is exactly the same as it was in stage one. You are required to generate one report listing patients with a specific condition. So for stage two, all you need to do is make sure you generate that report again. Please do not use the same report from previous years. Core measure number 12 is patient reminders. In stage one, this was a menu measure that required more than 20% of all patients of a certain age were sent an appropriate reminder during the reporting period. In stage two, this measure is similar, but has slightly different criteria. Instead of 20%, they actually dropped the percentage to 10% and then added the criteria that the reminders should be sent to patients with two or more office visits within the last 24 months prior to the beginning of the reporting period. So basically for 2014, you will need to send appropriate reminders to 10% of your patients that were seen at least twice from 2012 on. In order to perform this function within clinical, you will use the recall functionality. Core measure number 13 is educational resources. This measure used to be a menu measure but beyond that, it is exactly the same from stage one to stage two. You are required to provide patient-specific educational resources to 10% of your patients seen. This is accomplished in clinical by using the Education Materials button. In 5.1, we have enhanced the Education Materials button to allow you to link directly to Medline Plus, which is a free online library of health information. The benefit of this is that you will no longer have to manage your own paper copies of educational materials if you no longer desire to do so. Core measure number 14 is medication reconciliation. Again, this is another measure that used to be menu but has not changed beyond that from stage one to stage two. You are required to perform medication reconciliation for more than 50% of the patients transitioned into your care. 
To accomplish this in clinical, you will use the Medication Reconciliation button. Core measure number 15 is Transition to Care Summary. In Stage 1, this was a menu measure that required you to produce a Transition to Care Summary for more than 50% of your patients that were transitioned or referred to another provider. In Stage 2, this still holds true, but they've also added some additional criteria to the measure. The measure is now broken down into three parts. First, the EP must provide a transition to care summary for more than 50% of the patients transitioned or referred to another care setting or provider. Secondly, within that 50%, 10% of those referrals need to be transmitted electronically using a certified method. Clinical will accommodate this process using direct project. Your electronic transition to care summary will be sent using our messaging dialogue. The last part of the measure requires your practice to conduct a successful electronic exchange of the transition to care summary with either another practice that is not using STI's EMR product or using CMS's test validator tool. We assume most practices will elect to use CMS's designated test tool since it will probably be easier to accomplish. Core measure number 16 is submitting immunization data to state registries. In stage one, this was a menu measure stating that you had to perform at least one test submission of immunization data to your registry. All you had to do was send a test file and didn't necessarily need to submit ongoing data. In stage two, you'll be required to send your immunization information on an ongoing basis. In order to accomplish this measure, you will need to be set up with your state's immunization registry. If you have not already done so, please contact software support and someone will contact you about getting set up. And lastly for the core measures, core measure number 17 is secure electronic messaging. This is a completely new measure, so this is not something you had to do in stage one. In stage two, you'll be required to receive a secure electronic message from more than 5% of your patients seen during the reporting period. In order to accomplish this, your patients will need to use the Chartmaker Patient Portal. You will receive credit for this measure when your patients send you a message through the Patient Portal. Only message types of refill requests and health question will count towards this measure. Now let's talk about the menu measures. You are required to complete three out of the six measures available. Please keep in mind that while there are exclusions provided for some of these menu measures, you cannot select a measure and claim the exclusion if there are other measures that you could report on instead. As you can see, most of the measures are completely new for Stage 2. The only exception is a syndromic surveillance measure. So let's talk about each one of these measures in detail. First up is submitting electronic syndromic surveillance data to public health agencies. In Stage 1, this measure was a menu measure that required you to perform at least one test of providing electronic syndromic surveillance data to public health agencies. Most offices did not select this measure because most of the states did not have the means to accept this information electronically for EPs. In Stage 2, the only thing that has changed with this measure is that instead of just submitting a test file, you will now be required to submit ongoing data to your public health agency. As far as we can tell, no states in the tri-state area are set up at the moment, and the ones that are require the provider to pay a hefty fee for the service. So we assume most practices will not elect to do this measure. If you are still interested in attaining this measure, you should contact your state's health department to find out more information. The first new menu measure that we'll discuss is recording electronic notes in patient records. In order to attain this measure, you must enter and sign at least one electronic progress note for more than 30% of unique patients seen during the reporting period. This is somewhat of an easy measure because in order to meet other meaningful use requirements, you must do so by entering an electronic progress note. We can assume that most providers will elect to do this menu measure. The third menu measure is having imaging results accessible through your certified EHR. 
If you elect to do this measure, you will need to have 10% of all tests with one or more images ordered by the provider accessible in the EMR. In order to attain this, you will need to first document the order through your progress note using a procedure checklist. Then you will need to use the orders tracking functionality to mark the order as completed and reviewed with image. This process of ordering and tracking the procedure is how the software will know how to calculate the number of image tests you ordered. Menu measure number four is recording patient family health history. This measure requires that more than 20% of all unique patients seen have at least one entry for one or more first degree relatives as structured data. In 5.1, our family history button will change from a free text dialog to a structured data dialog. And in order to attain this measure, you will need to use this functionality. This is a rather easy measure, so we assume most providers will elect to complete this measure. Menu measure number five is reporting cancer cases to a public health cancer registry. This measure requires ongoing submission of cancer case information to a public health registry. However, this measure will not be an option for our clients as STI has elected not to partner with any cancer registries at this time. Please be aware that you will not be able to select this measure as one of your three menu measures. And lastly, menu measure number six is reporting specific cases to specialized registries. In order to attain this measure, your practice must successfully submit ongoing data of specific case information to a specialized registry for the entire reporting period. STI has partnered with the Pinnacle Specialized Registry to allow submission of diabetes, heart disease, coronary artery disease, hypertension, heart failure, and atrial fibrillation data. These are the only six cases that are permitted to be sent. So if your practice does not diagnose or directly treat any of these cases, you will not be able to select this measure. Finally, in regards to the measures, now let's discuss the clinical quality measures and what has changed with them in stage two. You are required to complete 9 out of 64 available CQMs. Beginning in 2014, the reporting of clinical quality measures, or CQMs, will change for all providers. All providers, regardless of stage or program, will follow the new 2014 CQM criteria. Additionally, if you are beyond your first year of meaningful use, you will now be required to report your CQMs electronically to CMS as well. Medicare EPs will have the option to either submit their 90 days of CQM data through the CMS registration and attestation system, or you can submit a full year of data using the QRDA format to receive credit for both the EHR incentive program and the PQRS program. If you are working to attain PQRS, then it is worth your while to submit the full year of data to simplify the process. However, keep in mind that you will not receive your incentive payment until your CQM data is submitted. So if you wait to send a full year's worth of data because you are participating in PQRS, then you may not receive your incentive payment immediately after attestation. Medicaid EPs will submit their CQM data to their state Medicaid agency. Another new requirement for CQM data is that the measures selected must cover at least three of the six available National Quality Strategy, or NQS, domains. These domains represent the Department of Health and Human Services priorities for healthcare quality improvement. The domains include patient and family engagement, patient safety, care coordination, population and public health, efficient use of healthcare resources, and finally, clinical processes slash effectiveness. When you view the list of CQMs, there will be a designation as to which domain the measure is associated with. To aid in the process of selecting your nine CQMs, 
CMS has come up with a recommended core set of CQMs for both the adult and pediatric population. If one of these sets is applicable to your patient population, CMS recommends choosing those nine CQMs. However, you are still able to select your own list of nine CQMs if you'd rather go that route. The recommended CQMs for the adult population are listed here. As you can see, some of the measures are the same as they were in Stage 1, and some of them are new. CMS feels that these recommended core sets focus on areas that represent national public health priorities or disproportionately drive health care costs. Here is a list of the nine recommended CQMs for the pediatric population. Again, some are new and some are old. If you would like to view a full list of the 64 available CQMs to select from, you can visit CMS's website and search for Clinical Quality Measures. We talked briefly earlier about reporting CQM data and said that it would be done electronically in 2014 and beyond. However, the exact process has not yet been defined by CMS. You will be required to submit an electronic file with your data, which will be extracted from our clinical program. However, we believe that it will be a separate process from the actual attestation wizard. For those of you opting to send 90 days of data, you will send your file immediately after attestation. For those of you sending a full year of data, to receive credit for both the EHR Incentive Program and the PQRS Program, you will submit your CQM data as an electronic file between January 1st and February 28th of 2015. Payments will not be made to providers until CQM data has been received. If you submitted your data between January 1st and February 28th, you should not expect your incentive payment before spring of 2015. So the last question on everybody's mind is probably, when can I upgrade to the 2014 certified version of clinical? According to our current release schedule, we should have a production version of the 5.1 release available sometime in the second quarter. 5.1 will be our certified version for 2014. Please continue to check our website for more up-to-date information regarding this release. As a friendly reminder, STI is not meant to be your only source of information on the EHR Incentive Program. We are really only required to educate you on how to attain each measure from within our own software. So please stay proactive and do not forget to conduct your own research on the Incentive Program to ensure that your practice is fulfilling all the requirements necessary. I have listed a few websites here that are very informative and should be bookmarked and visited on a regular basis. That concludes our presentation today on the changes Stage 2 of Meaningful Use will bring. If you have any questions regarding the information contained in this presentation, please contact customer support at 1-800-487-9135.